Hello, everyone. Um, we have also a global audience, so thanks for tuning in. Uh, I am Baba Kapasade, CEO of Toronto Centre. A warm welcome to you to our executive panel on climate change, biodiversity loss, and food security crises. Since our establishment 25 years ago, Toronto Centre has trained more than 20,000 <clears> supervisors and regulators from 190 countries and jurisdictions to become change agents for building more stable uh, and inclusive financial systems. I would like to thank our key sponsors, uh, Global Affairs Canada, the Swedish CETA, and the IMF. In 2016, we began incorporating climate risk in our training programs because of the substantial implications to global financial stability and risk of crisis from climate change. We're also very happy that since then, uh, standard setters and uh, uh, new organizations like NGFS are on, on board with this issue and we're very pleased to be partnering with the NGFS. Climate change, biodiversity loss, food insecurity, geopolitical uncertainty, supply chain bottlenecks, and high inflation, I'm losing my breath, should not be seen in isolation. At Toronto Center, we see these as intertwined with financial inclusion. For example, an estimated 80% of small farmers lack access to formal agri-insurance. Financial supervisors are part of the multi-stakeholder crisis, ecosystem of crisis management, and must continue to adapt to evolving risks and strengthen the financial resilience of various actors. Today, our distinguished guests will discuss badly needed insight on these challenges, Sometimes you never know who you get for a speaker, but I can assure you these are excellent speakers. They've all been tested at Toronto Center events before. And uh, we're very honored to have uh, governor, former governor, uh, Stefan Ingves of the Central Bank of Sweden, who's also our chair and a longtime board member of Toronto Center. The Honorable John Rongombwa, um, governor of the National Bank of um, Rwanda, and Neza Hayat, who's the chair and CEO of the uh, Moroccan Capital Markets Authority, who was gracious enough to host us for a, a, a Keystone program back in 2019 in Rabat. And our moderator and friend, Jean Pesme, Global Director, Finance and Competitiveness and Innovation of the World Bank Group. You have received their bios, so let's begin. Over to you, Jean. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much, Barak. It's always a pleasure uh, to do something with you all. Andrew. Happy birthday to the Toronto Center. 25 years is quite something, so uh, that's a very good opportunity. And thank you very much for inviting me and the bank to this panel on a really, really important and timely topic. So I don't, I don't think I need to overemphasize it. But really, this issue of climate change, biodiversity loss, food security is one of the key crises of the moment. So as Babak mentioned, we need to think about it in terms of response to crisis, but also how do we mobilize funding, in particular private capital, to be able to address those challenges. So I think this is really very much in the, um, at the center of the global discussion at the moment. So thank you very much for organizing this panel and thank you very much to the panelists for joining us with very different perspectives. So I think that's also where we will really benefit uh, from this discussion. Uh, so Stefan, I'm going to, to start with you. You've been part of this global discussion for quite some time. We've seen since the Paris Agreement that the climate crisis and climate change is really at the center of the agenda of many government, international organization, financial institution, and we've seen a growing number of institutions realizing that it's also not just about climate change, but biodiversity is really uh, getting higher on the agenda. And obviously we see it on the ground, uh, the food security crisis. So um, on, on uh, um, biodiversity, last year the NGFS uh, published a report on central banking and supervision in the biosphere which recognizes by that di biodiversity loss is a potential of uh, economic and financial risk. So part of it is why are uh, banking, uh, central bankers, supervisors coming to that topic? A bit unusual, so it would be good if you can give us a little bit of big picture, set the scene for the discussion on your views on the nexus between climate change, biodiversity and food security, how much uh, is one driver of the other? What are the interconnections? But also, how does that relate to financial stability? What's the nexus with financial stability? So, Stefan. Thank you. Uh, first, let me say that if you read the recent reports on climate change, those recent reports are not happy reading. No. So, 
from that perspective, it look, doesn't look good. But on the other hand, what, is, what has changed is that if you go, let's say, five years back, and you talk about these things in the central banking community, <coughs> uh, there's basically nothing there. Yeah. So if you read up on this topic and think about recently published reports, they actually have reference lists. And five years ago, there were no such reference lists. And that's just saying that this is actually on the agenda of many, many more than in the past. But on the other hand, at the same time, it's clear that if you look at the what central banks do and what supervisors do, climate change, biodiversity, these topics are not sort of included in what is listed in the legal frameworks of these institutions. So when you so when you uh, when you deal with these issues, uh, it, it comes kind of indirectly. But nonetheless, this is still important because what is going on now is likely to affect how the economy functions. And it is also highly, highly likely going to affect both the, um, the macro picture in many countries and at the same time financial stability in one form or the other. So indirectly, you actually, if you are in the business that we are in, you actually need to understand what is, uh, what is going on. And at the same time, from one perspective, we are talking about macro, macro developments. But at an, another perspective, is sort of more micro in the mm. sense that you actually need to understand if you are in the banking business, what kind of a credit portfolio you are sitting on. And, um, and, and if you don't, then you are actually likely to not understand the risk that you are taking. And that's why this is highly, highly uh, relevant. And let me give you just two examples. Uh, by now, it seems to be well known that the spruce bark beetle <laughs> is actually destroying the trees in Sweden. And we produce quite a lot of pulp and paper. And then, of course, you need to understand what, does that, what that does to the pulp and paper industry. Moving over to this country, uh, you have uh, right now uh, flooding in California. And that, of course, is uh, affecting the agricultural industry in, in, this part, uh, in this part of the world, and substantially, substantially so. And at the same time, there is a conversation going on about uh, uh, what, ha what is happening with bees. Because you need bees in this country and all over the world for pollination. And if there aren't any bees, well, then you won't have a lot of project, produce. And in that sense, referring to your question, all these issues are interdependent. Like it or not, they truly, truly are. But <clears throat> We are not good at, as of yet, to fully understand those independency, interdependency. So we do have some homework to do. Very good. So, uh, Governor, let's turn to you, including the perspective from um, an emerging market. So I'm going to start with the link with food security. So recently, the uh, Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN, the FAO, uh, noticed that the global loss of diversity is threatening um, uh, 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 food security, food supplies, the livelihood of millions of people, including the one in your countries. So from, from that perspective, how do you see climate change biodiversity as a threat to Rwanda, uh, financial system and economic stability, and, and generally more Africa, and the own Afri Africa is also very exposed to this risk. And what can central bank and supervisor do in that respect, and how do you link that to your mandate in the context of Rwanda? Yeah, thank you. Uh, and thanks to the Toronto Centre for organizing this session and for inviting us to be part of these discussions. We, we appreciate what we are doing with the Centre today. He talked of capacity building. We are benefiting a lot from the Centre in terms of building capacity of our staff in, uh, in supervision and in orientation of risk-based supervision. So coming back to this topic of today, I think as my colleague Stefan said, uh, sort of new to central banks and uh, we, we especially in our part of the world, we are really starting to understand what it is, what impact you have on our mandates. And may not be that, uh, of, may come from different channels compared to maybe the developed world. I think for, for us, the biggest impact of climate change today is on our agriculture. And uh, mainly because our agriculture is still predominantly uh, linked to the weather patterns on how the weather, how rains are uh, coming in different periods. So we, we, are, we were used to 
normal rain periods, like for example in Rwanda and many African countries, we have two crop seasons. And in most cases, we'd be assured of rains during those crop seasons. But today, uh, we're no longer assured of when the rains are coming or whether it's enough for, 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 uh, uh, for agriculture. And so one is we, we are facing prolonged droughts, uh, and that affects, of course, uh, farming. And uh, the other channel is through uh, 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 floods. Mm -hmm. Flooding, yes, but it's not as big maybe as we see in the West, but it also really affects as affects agriculture to a big extent, but it mainly affects on the fiscal side because it destroys infrastructure. But coming back to, to uh, droughts, like today in Rwanda we have inflation we've never experienced uh, since 2008 during the financial crisis. And this is really two angles that are merging to cause this big problem. So we have the the normal global challenge that everybody is facing with high inflation in every, uh, every country. Uh, but that, for example, when I look at my colleagues in the region, their inflation is around 10% or so. But ours has been exacerbated by agriculture, by low produce of food crops last year. The entire, the two seasons I say we have in a year, we lost it last year because of prolonged droughts. And uh, Today, agriculture, I mean food inflation, has gone about 50%. And overall, inflation is around 20% uh, by, by December. So these are high numbers that are really linked to climate change. And when we talk of inflation, it's not just about uh, the prices on the market affecting uh, the consumers, but also the, the yields, the, the agriculture itself. More than 50% of our population get their income through agriculture. So with this prolonged drought, they lose their, their yields, they lose their income, and so it's affecting the overall government uh, uh, program of fighting uh, uh, poverty, reducing yeah. poverty. So when I look at our case, we're really mainly affected through economic instability because our mandate of economic stability is being challenged. And now with inflation linked to agriculture, we don't have monetary tools we can use to fight this inflation link to agriculture. We've been really using the tools we have to fight second round effects of this inflation, but with little impact on the trend. So we, we only hope we'll, really be, we'll manage this uh, inflation to bring it down to our levels, uh, our uh, band of between two and eight, if agriculture goes well. Good thing with our tools we've seen what we call underlying or core inflation going down, but agri food inflation has just kept going up. So that's a big challenge we are seeing linked to climate change. In terms of uh, financial stability, uh, it's not that big because mm -hmm. we, which is, <laughs> it's a blessing to the financial, to the banks mainly, because they don't have big exposure in agricultural projects. Yeah. Uh, it's, in fact, in banks, it's just about 1% uh, of their total loans go to agriculture. Well, that is good for financial stability, but it's bad for economic development because the main financing arm of economic development is the banking industry. It's not financing one of our key sectors of the economy. Agriculture contributes about 25% of our economy. So, but really from the financial stability point of view, at 1%, we don't see any big challenge to mm -hmm. stability, though even this 1%, their uh, uh, non-performing loans are much higher than yeah. any other sector. In fact, like, like last year, I think we're at around 26% of this uh, NPL. So I would say climate change is real. And when I talk, I'm giving Ron an experience, but this is really almost similar to most of our colleagues on the African continent. We, 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 we are having big challenges on agriculture and so the investments now, what the government has been doing in our case is trying to, to encourage insurance in the agricultural sector. Insurance has been almost non-existent. Yeah. It's just now that through government projects that are giving farmers subsidy, that are helping to educate farmers together with insurance companies, yeah. that we start seeing now insurance coming to support uh, or, or to, self, to protect the farmers against these uh, shocks. Yeah. 
but also uh, it is taking time to understand it and even the insurance sector is fearing because they are not yet uh, good enough to assess the risks they, they, they're insuring. But, but at least this is one positive step that will help to, to ease the challenges we see in agriculture. So all in all, big challenge for us as, as a central bank, we've uh, we just started to understand what these, these uh, uh, climate issues uh, mean to our financial sector. We've, we are carrying out a diagnostic study to see how the readiness of our banks in, in dealing with the uh, shocks. Maybe I'll say that uh, for on the next uh, comment, what we are doing to try and address issues to do with green financing versus brown financing or whatever. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Governor. And thank you very much for bringing the resilience and God. We may come back to that later because we focused a lot on stability and risk, but there is also that resilience and going to now to reach out to small farmers and households. So maybe we'll come back to that a bit later. So Neza, let me turn to you. So you bring a very different perspective, which is the one of a security supervisor. But in addition to the, your work in Morocco, you're also um, um, playing a role as the chair of the Africa Middle East Regional Committee of IOSCO. So we see a lot of move in the securities uh, supervisory uh, family. So can you el elaborate a little bit on how capital market regulators can help mainstream sustainable finance? What are the opportunities and the cost? And what are you drawing from your, the less, what lessons are you drawing from your work in Morocco, the challenges that you are facing in Morocco, but also in discussion with your colleagues um, in, in the African continent and Middle East, what they say they see as their role, but also the challenges. Okay, thank you, Jean. Well, first I'd like to thank to our presenter, uh, Chair, President Siubabak, for inviting me to this panel today. Um, I'm very happy we, we have an active participation within Toronto as an active member of the Toronto Center Securities Advisory Board. We also very happy to, to uh, benefit from the different uh, uh, seminars that we organized and uh, together we had one on green finance uh, just before COVID, as you mentioned the back. So uh, our, in fact, our, our journey and uh, uh, in, in this field uh, of green finance and how capital markets regulators and uh, uh, securities regulators uh, uh, can play a role. Well, it started the uh, at least for the Moroccan Capital Markets Authority. It started and it started a bit, a little bit before IOSCO started to talk to think that we had a role to play, and that was during COP22 in Marrakesh. So uh, because uh, we we understood that it was the COP of the African continent, but it was also the COP to mobilize resources to 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 address climate change. Uh, 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 investments and uh, uh, to tackle the climate uh, uh, climate change issues. So what we've done as uh, first Moroccan Capital Market Authority, but also, and this is the link with the central bank, we uh, we we first work, worked on a national roadmap. Sustainable in, in development uh, in Morocco is embedded by the Kingdom Constitution. So. Uh, sustainable development and the financing of the sustainable development it is uh, is a priority and we started to draw a national roadmap gathering uh, uh, all regulators central banks uh, ministry of economic finance the uh, insurance supervisory banking system uh, investors uh, to to tackle all this issue and to see what was our role and and within our Financial Stability Committee that is being, that is held twice a year. We 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 do we we see the progress of what we're doing. So as related to to the supervisors of capital markets, we usually uh, uh, our mission is to protect investors, uh, ensure the good functioning of market, fairness, integrity, transparency. So we we start. We tried to understand what would be our role, and uh, our role was to see how the tools, if instruments within capital markets could, could attract uh, investment for, to, uh, for uh, sustainable projects, sustainable investments. So what we did, instead of working first 
on the regulatory issues or legal issues, we had the more flexible and dynamic approach. We started with guidelines. With uh, um, IFC, we, we had that we published our first guidelines on green bonds uh, to enable uh, to enable companies, corporate, to, to finance then their green project. And uh, we, we, uh, we published this, uh, the, the, this first guideline, uh, uh, of course, including all the international standards at that time and explaining. So we started with guidelines and we've seen, uh, we've had issues explaining. It was also the, the opportunity to, to explain what, uh, to explain to the investors what they have to expect, to, to cooperate the, their, uh, their requi the requirements that we will have in terms of uh, uh, information, of disclosure, um, and it enabled uh, since then uh, a certain number of issues, green, sustainable, also gender oriented. So this, and then little by little we included mandatory reports in our regulation. Mm -hmm. So instead of uh, working hard to, to introduce this, uh, the, this issue within our legislation, we started and then little by little we, and uh, so what we have done as well uh, on the, the, as we had this national roadmap during uh, COP22, we also, uh, we, we pushed an initiative called Marrakesh Pledge that uh, gathered uh, African uh, capital markets regulator as well as, uh, as stock exchanges, African, to uh, commit, uh, to, uh, to, to commit uh, uh, and develop the uh, sustainable capital markets. So this is what we've done. And, uh, uh, this uh, and uh, today we are an active uh, contributor within IOSCO because we were the first, uh, the, the the first to understand that we had a role to play. We had that momentum, the COP22 in Marrakesh, and little by little today there is IOSCO talks about it. We have a, uh, we uh, we have a committee, a task force. And uh, we, within IOSCO and we, within the AMERC, which is African Middle East Committee, uh, our role uh, also is to explain, not only to share the experience and expertise that we've had in different jurisdictions, because we, 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 we try to, to share and uh, learn from the other's experience, because as we were all, I think we were very late and uh, it's, uh, it's a it's a problem. It's not a, it's not the only field where we have to we, we come after after uh, something is, uh, exists. And we see that in other fintech issues, and we and we have to regulate. We have to explain, and we have to understand what is our role. And today on the continent, we uh, we uh, we assist each other. There's a lot of uh, efforts in uh, financial education explaining and also uh, uh, sharing the expertise and see how it can be adapted in other uh, markets within the region. So. Thank you very much. Neza, one element that I want to flag and maybe there will be a question is also what's coming in terms of disclosures. It's not working. Is it working now? Okay. So uh, <coughs> securities uh, regulators will have a very important role to play very soon on disclosure because the ISSB mm -hmm. is soon going to disclose uh, its new standard on this. So also to flag the role that security supervisor will have in terms of contributing to sustainable finance when it comes to disclosure. So I'm going to turn to the second round of questions and then we will open the floor uh, for, for any question that you may have. And going back to Stefan, a little bit around that issue of mandate, which as you mentioned has evolved a lot. I think there was a lot of skepticism a couple of years ago. Now it's much more embedded. I think the ECB wrote recently that climate change makes monetary policy more difficult can affect the stability of financial and banking systems. I think this is now much more recognized and embedded. At the same time, the issue is also when we all jurisdiction move to net zero commitment and net zero economy, how can central bank supervisor grapple with that challenge, help uh, in um, uh, that transition to a net zero, managing that with the need to deliver price stability and financial stability. So how do you see that forward looking agenda and that facilitation of that transition? If, uh, well, first of all, 
transition will be diff probably di be different in many different countries because it's easy to talk about these things in the abstract. But one of the hardest things to deal with for us human beings is the difference between today and tomorrow. And when we start talking about tomorrow, usually we tend to say, well, that's for tomorrow, so let's not deal with it. And if we try to deal with it today, we tend to say, well, it's not my problem, it's somebody else's <laughs> problem. And that means that I, you would expect um, change to be uneven in different parts of the world and in different countries. And some of the, my guess is that some of the political processes uh, around this will be quite, uh, quite different. And I see this very, very clearly in my own country because there we have a elaborate conversation to become polite about uh, not in my backyard when it comes to uh, wind and wind power. And, and that will show up in many, many uh, places. And that, of course, can create uneven developments. And at the same time, it's obvious that you need to do these things. And when you do them, they will produce relative price changes between different means of production. Now, if you talk about this from a central banking perspective, a relative price change is actually not inflation. Yeah. So you, just have, you, you, you need to accept those relative price changes. But why at, the say, why at the same time, we just don't know whether those relative price changes also de facto will change inflation expectations. Mm -hmm. And if that is the case, then it's sort of the whole issue kind of morphs into monetary policy in one form or the other. And we haven't really seen that as of yet. And we need to think hard about how to deal with those, uh, the, th those, those things. And I actually think that a number of other countries in, in, in the developing part of the world are actually, will probably have much more experience when it comes to this, because as, as, uh, as we heard here, I don't know what the, uh, what, um, what the proportion of food prices is in the Rwandan CPI. But it's pretty, pretty big. Yeah. And that creates a completely different way of having to think about monetary policy in that, in that environment. Because I mean, it, should monetary policy be based on um, what happens to, uh, to the rains or not? I mean, that's the. That's a serious underlying issue when it comes to how you actually do these things and how you, uh, how you deal with it. And we don't, have, uh, we don't have the answers to that, but we do know that we will have to deal with it as best as, uh, as best as we can. And then, as I started out saying, in addition, for most central banks, uh, these types of issues are not really included in the mandate from the beginning. So solving these problems has to be dealt with by others. Uh, but we do uh, certainly do need to be aware of them and do our best uh, on our side. And at the same time, if you are uh, um, running a central bank or a supervisory agency, then of course at the super, super micro level, uh, you also need to be aware of what you do in, in terms of your own uh, carbon footprint. And, and that, that is also sort of technical issues that were from the beginning not really trained to uh, deal with, but we also have to ad adapt on that side. Thank you very much, Stefan. So segue to Rwanda, Governor. So what's the perspective? So Rwanda has committed to net zero uh, CO2 emission by 2050. At the same time, in some developing countries, the issue is less about mitigation, but more about adaptation. And what, what do you see as the role of the central bank in either facilitating, contributing directly to that transition? And how are you practically preparing for that role? <coughs> yeah, th thank you. I think it's a... Uh, uh I said it's a new area we, we are entering into, and we, we one, we joined our colleagues, uh, different institutions within our country under the Kigali International Financial Center, and we just put up a, a sustainable finance roadmap. So this is trying, through this we are working out to see how we can establish a, a framework and then uh, the National Green Taxonomy, really to try and understand what is happening and how we, we, we are. Yeah working towards uh, guiding this objective the government has given itself to at zero emissions. Again, it, it's not that big because we are not really big emitters as yeah. such, and uh, already the government has taken all decisions earlier. We're back in 2008 government banned plastic bags. So they had, as, as Stefan said, 
adjustment costs because this was mainly the packaging material used in, in the market. So it took time to adjust to new uh, uh, packaging materials and how that affected the, the, the pricing it wasn't that pronounced as such because it's, a, it's not a big component of the, of, the, of the basket as we say, but had an impact on some industries uh, in terms of their really trying to adjust to, to this uh, new uh, orientation the government had given. But, but again, the government has been really uh, keen on reforestation of the entire country. I think mm -hmm. originally we had a target of planting up 30% of our surface area by 2020. By 2020, we had exceeded that to about 33%. Uh, so we, we are not dealing with any big projects that are really big carbon emitters. We mm -hmm. don't have any big energy projects that uh, uh, we need to be transitioned out. So that in itself helps in terms of uh, the cost of transitioning to a green economy. So from our end, uh, also working with this uh, uh, framework we are setting up, we. we we are trying to understand what that means. Uh, so we, we've, as I said earlier, we've commissioned a study to see mm -hmm. what that means, what impact can it have on the, on the financial institutions, what do, uh, the how ready are the financial institutions to deal with this. So through this study, we're just starting to develop guidelines that will, will help uh, uh, the financial institutions to deal or to understand the climate uh, uh, risks within their, their, their financials. And so, we, we are still really trying to position ourselves, and I think one big challenge we saw already is really understanding exactly what are the channels of uh, yeah. how this is going to affect financial stability, the readily to, to get readily available numbers in a granular form that will help us to do proper analysis of how big this impact is. Uh, so, but it's not, it's not, it's, again, as Stefan said, it's, it's really different in different countries yeah. because we are, we are not heavily invested in, in, in uh, uh, carbon emitting projects that will require big cost to transition to green. Uh, but in any case, we, we, we need to understand what it is. So f f we are really trying to, to position ourselves as a central bank to build our capacity in understanding this. And so we, we recently, last year, I think, we, we joined the network of uh, central banks and supervisors for greening of the financial system to help us build our own capacity to learn from uh, the experiences of our colleagues and see how we position what we are doing. One, to support and uh, ensure financial stability through this transition. But at least the, 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 the original assessment, we don't think it will be a big challenge to us because of where we are in our development. So today it's easy for us, and this is a decision of the government, to go green as we are implementing different uh, development projects. It might be expensive today in terms of yeah. the, the initial investments, but long term it is good for the, for the country and for the economy. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you, both of you, for reminding us that it's very country-specific. But part of it is also to start, because by beginning the journey, you are learning a lot and you're building your own capacity to understand what are the more specific challenges, but also um, what may be your opportunities for action. So, and as I reminded us that Morocco started that journey at COP22, so quite some experience, still a long way to go. So how does this uh, learning by doing, to some extent, influence how you see the future? the world, but also address some of the challenges you may have found in the specific context of Morocco, and now that can help the global community also understand how to prepare to that. Thank you. Well, after this, uh, uh, since we started this journey, comes there, there is, and you, uh, you Jean, you, you reminded it, it's the issue of disclosure. And today, not only uh, through the sustainability uh, finance task force within IOSCO, but also in AMER, where IOSCO is undertaking work to, to, to assess the suitability of standards that we will probably have to, to adopt, the ISSB uh, uh, sustainability-related disclosure standards, because we need the reference, and uh, the work is being done to see, and we will probably uh, 
passed by uh, the next board or, or by June 2023, uh, I think IUSCO will be able to, to, uh, to disclose its position within our emerging markets, within our continent and region. We also, and the challenge is to make sure that every jurisdiction understands what these standards can uh, mean and their ability to adopt them. And uh, the challenges are a lot about capacity building, a lot about capacity building, uh, not only in each jurisdiction, understand, because, and, and uh, for, for not only for the investors, but also for the corporate understand what is expected if they want to, to, uh, to, to finance through capital market their sustainable uh, uh, projects, uh, uh, but also uh, to prepare uh, investors and fund investors to have uh, these, uh, to include uh, uh, um, uh, in, their, in their management uh, 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 policy to, to include the information regarding the uh, sustainable imp their impact on, on ESG on sustainability and uh, for well for the region we are currently uh, launching uh, for region of uh, uh, Africa and Middle East we're currently launching a, a survey to find out the ability and the, uh, of each country it is each country has its specificity is in a different level of development of this, uh, this issue, but also different development of capital markets. Sure. And we have to take everything into account. Uh, and uh, also the challenge in the continent is our markets are really fragmented. And so we need to, to, to have a really harmonized, uh, not only uh, regulation regarding capital markets, stock exchanges, but also the same understanding of uh, of the information and of the disclosure uh, requirements. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you to the three of you for setting the scene. So let's open to questions from the audience. Uh, so um, I think we have a mic already. If you can introduce yourself, sure. and if you want to uh, have one of the three panelists specifically answer your question, please flag it. But uh, let's open. We have a little more than 15 minutes for question and answer. So please, Fiona. I know you, so I, you, I can call my name, <laughs> Fiona. Um, thank you. I'm Fiona Stewart from the World Bank. Um, I'm interested in what the panel thinks is coming next. Thanks, Scott. So I think, Mr. Evers, you, you laid out very well. There's been a, a huge growth and, and knowledge of the topic, great work done on the stress testing, on the reporting, etc. But to be frank, we've not seen the financial sector really have the impact it could have on the real economy yet. What comes next? Do we need prudential capital charges? Do we need incentivized um, lending rates? Do we need to move to the next level from the risk assessment and the reporting to actual other policy tools to really have the impact on the real economy? So I think that's a question that may be for the three of you. Governor, do you want to start on including on yeah. that element of <laughs> how to bring the risk assessment into prudential thinking? Yeah, I, I think what, 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 she, what she's saying, which is uh, interesting is uh, maybe beyond the mandate of the central bank normally because our focus on financial stability is we are looking at the channels through which this could destabilize the stability of the banks. I think what you're asking is beyond that, what can be done to incentivize a financial institution to finance green projects against uh, maybe uh, I think it's uh, it's uh, it's better through other incentives brought through maybe a fiscal side or government uh, initiatives than really regulations by the central bank. Uh, I, I don't know, my, my colleague, my senior Stefan could say more on this. But I think it's, uh, it, it, it is always difficult to use regulations to, to sort of uh, direct or influence financing of the financial sector to a, to a certain sector or project of, of this nature. So it's, it, it will be difficult to really use the central bank money to do that. But normally what happens, like, like today, for example, in Rwanda, government has put up a project that is supporting financing the agricultural sector 
with lower interest rates, with the linked to uh, the, the side I said developing the, the insurance into agriculture. So that's, that's the best channel we can use to, and to support or to incentivize banks or financial institutions to finance uh, or to really focus on green financing than the, the bond financing. Difficult to use real regulations, but I, I would really request my senior Stefan to comment yeah, on that. I'll talk to Stefan also to stay <laughs> in the banking sector, but also because of your experience at Basel. And what you see, you see may be coming. So there is the domestic element, including do you use prudential or other incentive, but also what do you think the global banking community is up to and what may be coming our way? And then we will go to capital market news on the opportunity side, how to mobilize financing. Stefan. <coughs> Ideally, of course, one would like to have some kind of a grand plan and deliver on that plan, but in a complicated world, it's not going to happen. So one has to settle for various types of second, third, fourth, five, fifth bests. And one way of thinking about that is to try to create successes at the micro level. And then use those successes to explain to others what is going, uh, what, what is going on and and uh, why. And let me give you one, uh, one, one example. I happen to come from an institution which, was, which produced one of the first financial stability reports in the world in the mid-1990s. And today, you probably can find more than 50 to 100 central banks that produce various, and supervisory agencies that produce various financial stability reports. It makes a lot of sense in those reports nowadays to include a section on, 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 on the topic that we're talking about today. Yeah. What does, how does climate affect financial stability? How do we deal with reporting requirements? Do we have standards that, that are in some sense good enough? How do we avoid uh, greenwashing? And hopefully that over time builds capacity in such a way that these uh, issues are more easily understood and it's generally accepted uh, mm -hmm. that this is what you, uh, what you do here. Having said this, and maybe this is because I've been in this business now for a long, long time. During my entire professional career, I have listened to people who have come to me and said, you are an evil person, lower the risk weight. <laughs> <laughs> because because I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing such nice things. I have always been against <coughs> that because I have seen too many disasters during my professional life when you have wandered down that route. If you really want to do it that way, then <coughs> as we heard, it's a fiscal issue. Don't mess up the central banks and the supervisors by demanding putting risk weights down to zero when the risks are far higher than zero because that creates some serious, serious difficulties down the uh, down, the, uh, down the road. So that really should be avoided. And it really forces central banks and supervisors to do things that they don't want to do. And they, it forces them to do things that are not, really not in their mandate. There will always be a strong political pressure to, to do these, I call them tweaks. And why is that? Because in the short run, it appears to be for free. If, if I start tweaking the risk weights because of green this and that, nothing happens on the fiscal side today, but boy, what happens at some time in the future. But everybody is happy in the short run, both the bankers and the politicians, because you uh, appear to solve a problem that costs you nothing. And that's not a good way, uh, that's not a good way to go, uh, go about. So one has to try to use others, uh, other types of solutions. But, but I do think that we have some serious conversations ahead of us on the topic. What is it, what is for supervisors to do? What is for central banks to do? And what is actually fiscal issues? I don't have an issue. If you want to subsidize, subsidize this and that and the other in order to get these things moving, fine, fine, fine. But those issues are actually fiscal issues. And then on a completely different topic, which is very serious, it's, it's to think about it the other way around. And that is, today, there are by far too many subsidies on oil, coal, gas, in different forms. Get rid of those subsidies. 
I mean, that's a good, that's a good, uh, that's a good start. But we do know, and particularly people working for the IMF who have tried this for decades, how difficult it is to get get rid of those subsidies because if uh, if gasoline costs almost nothing, uh, well, people adjust to that, and then you you need to get rid of those subsidies. Thank you. So thanks to the two of you. I, I turn to and for the reminder that supervisor are very powerful but cannot do everything. Uh, and that they should not be pushed too far from their core mandate. But Neza, from a capital market perspective, there is also another angle to that discussion, which is mobilize private capital to move ahead in decarbonization, adaptation, et cetera. So what do you see as the agenda coming? What are the challenges? And what can be done about it? And then I will go back to the audience. No, absolutely. I, I totally agree that we, uh, we have to be neutral. I mean, but... Also, our mandate is to make sure that everyone, every stakeholder, understand what it is about, understand what, what are these, uh, uh, how uh, capital can be attracted to finance uh, uh, climate-related uh, uh, project, or climate-friendly uh, uh, projects, or sustainable uh, 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 projects in, in a way. So what is today, I think the challenge is first to there's a capacity building and to make sure that everyone understands very clearly uh, what are the commitments from it, from the investor, for the investors, for the corporate, for, for the regulators. And uh, uh, what we're doing is that, uh, as, and we, uh, we want to explain that capital markets can be an opportunity to finance and to attract all this capital, all this uh, uh, capital to, to, to finance projects uh, through capital markets. And by, so our role is to make it more clear, uh, to explain, to raise awareness, and also to, to try and, and find a way to, to, to adopt the same international standards or to avoid greenwashing, to avoid many misunderstandings, and to mitigate the risks. All risks are related because we have to manage by the risks today, also in capital markets, to avoid the other disasters that we've seen in uh, for other issues. So. Okay, thank you very much. So, Babak, you wanted nope, to come someone. in? Someone else in the audience? Else? Any question at the back? Uh, thank you. Um, very insightful panel. Uh, it's. It, it's undeniable that climate change is there, that the severity and frequency of events are occurring. And I appreciate your comments, Stefan, on stability. And, and the panelists have, have talked about the mandate of regulators. <laughs> but it, it occurs to me that, um, and if we look for, for the panelists' neighbors in Malawi and uh, Mozambique, who were impacted by Cyclone Freddy, uh, their contribution to uh, climate change was negligible. Um, but the suffering, uh, the devastation uh, was great. What advice do you have for regulators uh, to uh, enhance that conversation about the need to do more faster? Because uh, you know, you've all talked about the things that need to be done. But it, and Stefan, from your comments yesterday um, or earlier, the, the picture is not good. So how do we accelerate uh, the conversation for, with other regulators about the role that they can play to uh, improve our actions against climate change? Thank you. Thank you. So Stefan, maybe I'll turn to you. And then there was also a resilience angle to your question. So I will ask the panelists whether they can come to that. We have six minutes, so a quick sharp uh, answer. Yeah, a quick, a quick reply, just keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> OK, <laughs> super efficient. <laughs> okay. Governor, any perspective on that also on that mitigation adaptation and who should move first, but also how to raise somehow the resilience angle? You started alluded to that earlier, financial protection. So what can you do as regulator also to push for that agenda? It's linked to financial inclusion, but also new products being made available to our souls and farmers, etc. Yeah, I, I think to his question, to his comment, as, as my colleague said, to keep talking but and walk the talk. I think there's yeah. a lot of talking yes. and less doing. So with, with these COPs, I hope we can get better outcomes from the COPs. Uh, 
I, I think the issue of uh, we call it carbon financing or carbon credit. So, yeah. so how do we really uh, transfer the, the challenges? The, for example, the countries you mentioned Mozambique, uh, uh, Malawi, or small islands in, 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 in the Caribbean here are facing with less contribution to this burden. How do we transfer resources from the biggest contributors to this burden, mm -hmm. support the these to adapt to, to, to mitigate these risks? So I, I think there we need really to push to have actual things happening that, than the talking. I think there's a lot of talking yeah. and less is happening on the ground. Unfortunately, there's always that tilt of uh, influence and power in this talking. So the, the the, the, the country is saying, I don't think they have big influence and power in influencing what happens on the table. So we need really these independent minds to support the, the, the voices of these uh, countries that are suffering. So I, I think that's, that's, from the greater point of view, uh, yes, as I said, we have this network that we're working together to see what we can do. But I think there's the channel through the corps that can yield better and quicker results than yes, the, 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 the meeting of regulators or the, 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 the network of regulators. I think on resilience, we, we, we talked about the, the, the really trying to, 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 to see what kind of uh, investments going forward. And as I said, for example, in our case, it's now easy that the national development agenda promotes green uh, almost a green economy. So in mm -hmm. terms of whatever you, you're doing, in, uh, the projects coming up, there's always that, uh, whether in a building uh, uh, requirements, that green factor is, is, or climate change is embedded yeah. into that. So th that will help the country. But of course, unfortunately, we have these big uh, shocks coming from the global warming yeah. itself that we can't do much about. Uh, so positioning our, our, our banks in terms of understanding the risks and uh, well, as I said, stress testing against the risks, what are the possible channels they will be hit through these uh, 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 challenges linked to climate change and how do they get against that. I think that's what we are trying to do as regulators. But in terms of the, the going forward, <laughs> at least in our case, government is serious about really greening the economy and that helps a lot. But uh, to what she said, it's making it a bit expensive to finance projects. And therefore, uh, there, that's where we need to see how we get these monies outside there that are supposed to support uh, the mitigating fire initiatives to, to, to make it easy uh, for these uh, projects to get affordable financing. Very good. Neza, last word from you, and then we will conclude the panel. Maybe what we have intended to do in Morocco to accelerate, we first worked on a national framework with all the I mean, all the regulators, and this is important, and the and the stakeholders, and also we have tried. To, we've had this pragmatic approach. I think it's important. This is what we're sharing to explain and to to promote the innovation within the capital markets to to attract. Uh, the funding for these projects, and this is what we have done, and what we have shared, and what we're sharing uh, with with other countries and with other regulators. I agree that there are momentums, and the COP is always the the, the COP uh, event is always the the opportunity to uh, to gather all stakeholders and also to promote this these uh, uh, different tools different tools to, to finance and accelerate the financing of the climate transition. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the three panelists. Very complementary perspective. A lot has been done, still a lot to be done. But let's respect the mandates and the role, including what is the government, what are uh, supervisory monetary authorities. Capital market, obviously, very important role to play. Um, your, your national expense are also very interesting because coming from different angles, it reminds us that it's going to be very localized and not one size fits all. But sharing information, including through the network like NGFS and, and the many work that is going on is very important. So thank you very much. Thank you to the Toronto Center thank you. Uh, again. And, um,
Thank you for this discussion on a very relevant topic. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.